So tonight we're talking about the directors who are up for awards uh, in, in, in all categories, writing, directing, screenplay, editing in some cases, and also being honored by the Santa Barbara International Film Festival, which is what we reviewed the most. So we had the pleasure of watching the virtual interviews online like we do every night prior to producing this review at the Rose Wall. So we had four directors, and I'll read their names, but then I'm gonna tell you the details about their films and the ones they made, and we're gonna have an interaction here with each other. Um, we, we saw Lee Isaac Chung, who directed Minari, Chloe Zhao for No Man Land, David Pincher for uh, Manx, and a wonderful Danish director, Thomas Vinterberg, uh, really a surprise nomination for another round. So those were directors for who were interviewed this evening. Honored with the uh, Santa Barbara International Film Festival's Outstanding Director Award. I exactly, yeah. yes. All four of them received the award. It's not like a competition. They already have their awards. Uh, the Santa Barbara Film Festival awards them sort of in advance. So we know that going into these interviews, who, who, and who they are and why they're there. Hmm. Um, it's not as if they're running against each other or there's a final award ceremony or anything like that. That's normally how film festivals work around the world, from Venice to Toronto to Sundance. And by the way, the Santa Barbara International Film Festival is up there uh, among all those that I just mentioned, including mm -hmm. Cannes. They have great acclaim around the world, and normally when we're not in our cave-dwelling situation, uh, Santa Barbara, I think, sinks about an inch and a half. Uh, geographically for the amount of people that arrive there from all over the world and the streets are just packed with different languages and different faces and different people from different places uh, attending movies all day long in several theaters and chit chatting mm -hmm. on the corners it's very very exciting and then of course we have the big red carpets where we normally work uh, but here we are at the Rose Wall instead so again if you're just tuning in you'll you'll find out more about us if you watch the series as, as you wish. So we'll start with um, Lee Isaac Chung for Minari. This is his fourth feature film. And he told us he was about to give up filmmaking at the age of 39 and go back to Korea to be a professor. Uh, there is a thread through all of these films uh, that also relate to all of us that um, I'll determine, I'll, I'll tell you about in the end. but. He persevered and decided, uh, well, I'll take one more swing in it and I'll write a screenplay about my own memories coming to the United States as a young kid to Arkansas, of all places, from Korea. Mm. So imagine that, the difference. <laughs> wow. Um, and for the Asians, it shows them what it's like to be in America, things that they wouldn't know about. And for us, it addresses again that story about, the all important story about the immigrant. Mm. Now, it's, it's done, th the acting is just superb, and the, to me, the star of this movie is the little kid who plays him. But he did this as a dedication for his own daughter, because he wants his own daughter, who's being raised here in America, to, uh, to see this movie in the future. She's, she's about the same age as the little boy in the film. Um, and remember her own memories of having grown up in Arkansas. It's a, it sounds like they'll eventually go back to Korea. Who knows, this guy's on fire. He would be making a whole lot more movies, more than he can imagine. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. It's a really, really interesting movie. It, is, it has subtitles, but it's, it's not irritating because, you know, that's so hard sometimes when you're trying to read, especially not on a big screen, mm. you're trying to read a film as well as watch the action and you're, you're mm -hmm. reading a lot and thinking, oh, what did I miss? Or you're, mm -hmm. maybe you're watching mm -hmm. the action and you're not reading enough and you get a headache. <laughs> yeah, you can miss some of the performances. Oh my yeah. gosh. Or the words. You just decide to watch instead of read mm -hmm. at some point because you're so tired. <laughs> <laughs> this is not irritating because the ac action in this is so real. It looks like you're peering in on someone's personal life because it's so down to earth. It's so um, personal. It's almost like you're a voyeur in a way, looking out the window of your house into their backyard in a sense, and watching them get along and 
mm. try to make a go of it in the United States. So it's so gripping that you don't mind reading it, really. I, I didn't. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It pulls you in. I mean, I have to see it in full disclosure, but uh, I, I know what you're talking about when a film can kind of bypass that problem through sheer quality. It did. It did mm -hmm. indeed. That's exactly it. Um, the other thing it did is um, really show how much uh, children who are born to an immigrant family have a difficult time um, adjusting to their parents' culture mm -hmm. because they're here going to school, learning English, growing up with um, other American kids from wherever, mm -hmm. right? Arkansas, let's say, mm -hmm. okay? Which is really an interesting <laughs> difference. Mm -hmm. And um, struggling with coming home and having to be within the family cultural hierarchy, particularly an Asian one, where very often the, the grandparents, the great grandparents, and this is what's so lovely about those cultures, they honor their elderly, their mm -hmm. elders. Mm -hmm. And you're the little kid, and you're trying to assert yourself in America. And some of the most darling parts of this film is when the little kid and the grandmother, who just won the SAG Award for Best Actress, surprised everybody uh, are interacting because grandma's telling him the how to and the what for and the little kid is standing there talking to her in english and telling her the how to and the what for mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're trying to bridge this giant cultural gap because neither of them have a clue as to what the other one is experiencing mm -hmm. the kid not the asian culture and the grandma not the the, the new american culture mm -hmm. that's the brilliant point in this film it's really, it's really terrific. And Lee Isaac Chung has done a wonderful, wonderful job with that. Uh, the next one we, uh, and interestingly enough, another Asian uh, director, Chloe Zhao, for Nomadland. Now we've talked about Nomadland uh, this week so far mm -hmm. in a couple of different ways. Mm -hmm. She said, um, people go west when they lose their voice. Now in history, we know that about novels that we read or mm -hmm. films we've seen in the past. What is it about the West, I wonder? Is that because where the sun sets? Gosh, I'm sure you could write uh, whole books on, on just that question. Um, I think it has to do with the history and uh, geography of this country specifically. And mm. I'd be interested to know uh, uh, about that outside of a, a New World context yeah. as well. Yeah, it really yeah. struck me, exactly. Um, in this movie, there's a lot of, um, it addresses loss and, and death and an older generation of people, Americans, who have lost really everything um, and decided to take uh, vans and RVs and trucks across the country and just live as nomads and successfully. Mm. And, their, and their communities that they form that are transient and they come and they go and they may each other meet down the road again at some point in time um, but the but the interaction is terrific in this film because she, she, Chloe Zhao in in her past films also hires a lot of non actors, mm -hmm. real people in these real situations. So you see the that the people in this film the, are the actual nomads living that way in America. And by the way, it started a trend. I'm sure it amplified one. Yeah, amplified. Yeah. That's the word. Amplified the this trend. Right, because it's already a trend. Hello, mm. <laughs> but what she's really done, which is brilliant. And by the way, oh my gosh, a couple of by the ways here. Not only did she direct this, she wrote the screenplay, she produced it, directed it, and edited it. All of that. So she's up for something like six, six nominations for each one for a screenplay, for producer, for editor and for director, mm. Chloe Zhao is, credible. Mm. Um, and one of the things she said in another interview I watched was that she had to make sure that in this particular film with non, these non-actors, each and every one of them was treated with great dignity. Mm. And that shows, and that shows in this film. And, and for that I really appreciate her. Because imagine taking on something like that, someone's life and their loss mm -hmm. and then how how hard that would be to maybe accidentally make um, a mockery of it almost oh you wouldn't want that at all no mm -hmm. no but she brilliantly brilliantly treats them with just absolute dignity 
And they open up to her and to Francis Dorman, who plays off these non-actors brilliantly. Mm. Um, then she does 180 degrees and is the director and writer of Eternals, the next Marvel film about to come out. How does she do that? She goes from nor no man land to a Marvel film, The Eternals. This is not her first Marvel film. Quite the range with this with this director. That though. was the point. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, then David Fincher for Manx. Now Manx is a really really interesting film. Is it Manx or Mank? Mank. I'm oh. sorry, Mank. <laughs> That's I wrote I wrote Manx. Thank you so much. That's a, sure. a wonderful thing that you do for me. Is catch <laughs> all my mistakes. It's just awesome. Okay. Um, his father Jack Fincher actually wrote the script years and years and years and years and years ago. Hmm. Yeah, I thought that was kind of amazing because I, I, I didn't know that. Um, and this is a story set in the golden age of Hollywood, filmed in black and white. It stars the ever so amazing Gary Oldman as Herman Mankiewicz, I think that's where I got the Z, hmm. um, who wrote Citizens Kane. In, in real life, he authored that film. Citizen Kane. I'm sorry. I did that yesterday too, didn't I? <laughs> that's all right. Citizens Kane. <laughs> Look, C citizen. Citizen Okay. Mm -hmm. And there's also a bunch of other storylines in this film, and it's really, really interesting. It's got 10 nominations, 10. It's amazing. And one of the things, here's, here's a question for you. One of the things Dave Venture said was, it was pre-Brando acting mm. that he required of, of the cast and, and Gary Oldman. And I think what he meant by that was, Brando was not a star. Uh, at that time in Hollywood. He was an unknown. Mm -hmm. Rendo came later. Mm -hmm. And and he came with a real macho, sort of manly man, misogynist, kind of a rough and tough guy, you know, um, who I'm talking about, I'm sure. Brandon. Marlon, yeah, yes. absolutely, yes. absolutely. So what do you think he meant by pre-Brando acting? Uh, I risk... Uh, Speaking about something I don't know too well here, but I get the impression that Brando brought a different stylistic approach to acting that caught on after for men. him. For men. For men, and, and for, um, I think it relates to method acting somewhat oh, more. Okay. And, and, you know, I could be wrong here, but um, there's something a little more naturalistic, arguably, uh, in, in what he did versus the kind of. Um, um, acting that you would get still coming off of, of uh, Hollywood just introducing sound and some of the um, maybe now we would look at it and say it's less realistic. Oh that's interesting. I could be entirely wrong. No 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 that, I think because I couldn't I couldn't wrap my head around it but I think that's a good start. Cool. I, I, I really do think that's a good start because he also mentioned that he needed uh, Gary Oldman to be stripped naked practically. Mm -hmm without having hair and makeup, just the opposite of what he did in The Darkest Hour uh, mm -hmm. when we interviewed Gary Oldman that mm -hmm. first time, which is, was a remarkable, one of the top 10 movies ever about Winston Churchill. Mm -hmm. um, but he does, you don't recognize Gary Oldman at first in this movie. He has a horrible time writing this script and doesn't want to finish it and thinks it's just a failure, a complete failure. Uh, and we watch him go through all this and heavy drinking. Um, it's really an interesting film. The soundtrack is, is odd and a little chaotic, but David Fincher wanted it to be that mm -hmm. way because Gary Oldman's character is the author of, of this film. Chaotic and odd and, and, and so the scenes are just, they're really, really, really well done. It's, you have to see it more than once, this one. Mm. I think it's interesting how you point out not recognizing Gary Oldman in a way because we're so used to seeing him fully dressed up and now we see him just more naturally himself or or physically naturally himself and, and, and uh, also and we don't recognize him. It seemed like it was, yeah it is, you're right, that mm -hmm. is an interesting point. Um, but Gary Oldman has played some of the most bizarre parts in his career. From, from one end to the other, mm -hmm. and this is the most stripped down we've ever seen him. He, there's no veneer mm -hmm. here. Uh, half the time he's in bed and drunk in, in this film and being 
prodded to write this script and the other time he's out charming and hilarious and walking around in sort of a rumpled suit and mm -hmm. and just yucking it up it's it's really he's such an amazing actor so it's fun to see that for Gary Oldman for me anyway um, and then uh, finally the last one we we uh, saw interviewed up for best director in the Oscars is Thomas Vinterberg for another round and this was the big surprise nomination not for for best foreign film but best director mm -hmm. um, so it's um, it's truly amazing one of your favorite actors is in it remind me of his name again because I'll know I'll say it wrong uh, it's Mads Mikkelsen and he's I have a great deal of respect for him, but I haven't seen enough to say, you know, that he's he's my absolute favorite or anything. What, why do you respect him so much? Um, just what I've seen him in. He seems like a really um, talented, gifted person and artist. Is he Danish? I believe so. It sounds like it. Mm -hmm. Mads Mikkelsen. Mads Mikkelsen. Mikkelsen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh my gosh, tongue twister for me. Anyway, um, turns out Danish film is funded by the state. So asking them to support a movie about alcohol and the culture of drinking was fine. It was okay. He, mm -hmm. the, uh, the director, Thomas Vinterberg, knew quite clearly he wouldn't have that success trying to pitch this movie in uh, mm -hmm. Hollywood or, or raising money for it. Mm -hmm. um, it's unguarded, it's raw, it's completely chaotic. And he quote, I quote him by saying, and looked at the history and all the accomplished people who were not sober. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a great line, that he believes we all should be born with a little bit of alcohol in us. <laughs> it's, it's an important movie. I, I say that about all these movies, because of course they're the top. They're all up for awards. And um, every night in one of these series, I, I tell Journey, oh, you have to watch this, and you have to see this, that, and the other thing, because we see different movies. We just cover different things. Mm -hmm. And so now I finally told him that I'm not going to insist he sees anything else except for another round. <laughs> <laughs> so th those are the directors we saw. Now what the thread is, I think, that went through all four of these movies, and in their personal stories themselves, because... I want to mention that Thomas Vinterberg lost his daughter to a, car, a tragic car accident. She, she died in a car accident four days into the filming, the shooting of this film, and dedicated this film to her. Hmm. So in every single one of these films, whether it's the topic of the film or in their personal life, just to wrap this up, Lee Isaac Chung, who did Minari, was about to give up hmm. doing filmmaking at all and go teach, mm -hmm. but he persevered. The people in his film, the immigrants who come to our country, make it if they persevere. Mm -hmm. Same with Nomadland. These people have experienced incredible loss and persevere and they go out into the world and they drive west or they drive south or east. They did a lot of this in South mm -hmm. Dakota actually. That's where they filmed a lot of it and um, persevere. Um, in, in David uh, Fincher's movie, Mank, um, they, they all have to go after Gary Oldman's character, Mankiewicz, to get him to finish that script and persevere to the end. And he mm -hmm. really believes it's going to be the worst movie ever. He says that at one point in the film. Mm -hmm. It will be unsuccessful. <laughs> and of course, we know the... the uh, one of the most famous films of all time. Of all time. Mm -hmm. And then this young man, Thomas Vinterberg, who goes um, and does the movie Another Round, is about perseverance as well. Um, shall I say, come high, <laughs> come hell or high water and, and too much alcohol. Um, it, these people persevere in this film as well as he did because he lost his daughter four days in filming the film. So each and every one of these films, there's that thread of perseverance, whether in their personal lives or in the, in the content of the film. Plus, we all have persevered in this last year of 2020 and currently still in 2021, slogging through this pandemic and hanging in there and trying to keep each other well. So please continue, persevere, 
stay well. Come back to the Rosewall to see Journey Wade Hack and myself. And remember, this Saturday night on Saturday Night Live, um, which is the 10th of April, uh, Carrie Mulligan hosts Saturday Night Live for the very first time. What a treasure. I know, isn't it? Good deal. <gasps> and thank you, viewers, for... Thank uh, you for tuning in. Please yeah. subscribe if you want to. And look down below. There's hundreds of videos of the things we've done on the red carpet together as well. You see me or the side of my head or something, but... All of them are there because he filmed them. It's a symbiotic relationship. Yes, it is. Oh. And we shall persevere. <laughs>